And I want to thank uh, Jeff and the McClung Museum generally, the staff, for inviting me down here and uh, being such wonderful hosts for the couple days I've been here. Um, how many of you have actually seen the map exhibit? Can you raise your hands? A uh, fair number, okay. Well, um, I, I urge those of you who haven't seen it yet to, to go and see it. It's a really fine collection of very important maps uh, to be assembled in this, in this spot. Uh, along, some great maps of, of North America and the world and some very interesting maps of Tennessee and your area. So by all means, go and see it and hopefully uh, a few of the things that uh, I'll talk about today will, will help you to appreciate it more. Um, my topic today, how did they do that, uh, comes from what I think is a very basic question that people ask when they look at maps. We've all had the experience of standing in a field or on a seashore and looking out and thinking, now how, how would you go about mapping where I'm standing? How could that happen? And uh, the fact of the matter is if we're standing, if we're standing uh, on, a, on a flat surface like this and we look out, we can see something like three miles. That is if you're six feet tall. For me, it's more like two and three quarter miles. <laughs> but um, that's not really uh, a wide enough scope to get you, uh, get you to see much topographic detail. If we climb up to about 500 feet, we increase our uh, visibility to about 27 miles, which is uh, getting far enough to be able to depict coves and things like that. If we go up to the top of a 10,000-foot mountain, like this is Mount San Jacinto outside of Palm Springs, uh, your visibility extends to about 125 miles, which is, on a clear day, uh, enough to be able to generate a fairly good sketch of the surrounding area if, you're, if you know how to do that. I can't say that I do. Uh, if we're at 30,000 feet in an airplane, we can see something like 212 miles. And there you really begin to be able to pick out uh, considerable topographic detail. And many of you who enjoy window seats on, on your flights uh, uh, sometimes think that it's like a map going by underneath you. Well, if we go up even higher, this is, uh, this is the Horn of Africa taken from the shuttle Columbia in 1993 at 163 miles up. And we're looking north. Um, there's the Horn of Africa. This little projecting thing, I don't remember the name of it, but it's, uh, it's the, actually the easternmost point of the African continent. And from, uh, from 163 miles up, you can see about 1,200 miles. So when we get out to the horizon here, we're looking into the middle of the Arabian Peninsula. And there you begin to see a real recognizable piece of geography. In fact, here's a map from the Newberry collections from a Portuguese atlas of uh, about 1565 uh, showing that very area. Uh, you see we have the, the Horn of Africa. There's that little projecting point, And there's this, the Arabian Peninsula. I think that's supposed to be, well, I was going to say it's Mecca, but I guess not. It's uh, Judah. Jidda. That's probably Jidda. Um, and if we, if we were to wrap this part of the map on our aerial photograph, we'd see that kind of congruence, which I don't know, I think is, is pretty amazing. Uh, here you've got the horn, there's this little projecting thing. Here's the island of Socotra, which belongs to, Yem uh, to Yemen. Uh, it's actually out here, but I don't know, it seems to me it's pretty good, and it makes me ask the question, how did they do that? This is the famous blue marble picture taken by Apollo, taken from Apollo 17 in 1972, and they were at a height of 28,000 miles. So here, of course, you can see the entire globe. And on this particular shot, one of the more famous ones from that mission, you can actually see the entire continent of Africa, except for a little bit obscured by clouds. This is a, an Italian map uh, by a man named Forlani from about 1565. And uh, I think you'll recognize what it shows. 
And in fact, if we layer it over that aerial photograph, you see that it, it fits fairly well. Uh, so well that we might ask, how did they do that? This is a map of, how many of you recognize this? You might want, want to turn your head this way. It's, it's uh, New England looking from the east. Uh, we're looking west. Here's Cape Cod. Uh, this is actually Lake Winnipesaukee in, in New Hampshire. Uh, here's Rhode Island. I think this is the Connecticut River. Um, it's actually the first, uh, uh, the first map published in America, 1677, in John Hubbard's History of New England. We're going to lay it next to a modern uh, satellite photo. And I think you have to agree, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, if you start looking at details, well, okay, Nantucket isn't, or Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket aren't quite in the right place, and Rhode Island is actually further out there, but... Generally speaking, it's not bad, and you wonder how they did that. And I want to just have a little local example. This is uh, uh, General Smith's map of the Tennessee Comfort, uh, government. I think it's 1825. And, of course, you can see Knoxville. And here is the modern satellite image. Now, of course, I don't, want to, I don't want to make any claims that this is an incredibly accurate map, but it does show, there's Knoxville there, it does definitely show its position between these two northeast, southwest trending rivers, and you certainly do see the northeast, southwest trending mountain lines. So, how did they do that? Well, to begin with, um, I want to go way back to, uh, to the ancient times and uh, answer a question that many people, uh, I don't know, when I grew up, I learned that at the time of Columbus, everybody thought the world was flat and, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, the fact is that uh, anybody with any uh, scholarly pretensions or even any practical navigation experience knew very well that the world wasn't flat, but um, it's, 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 hard, it's a hard thing to realize that when you're standing on the world, standing on a beach, and this is a, a, a little from a cosmography, 1524, that attempts to explain to people, uh, to give them one proof for the rotundity of the world. And what, what he's, in effect, saying here is, uh, here's, the, here's the moon, uh, here's the earth, and here's the sun. If the earth were a, what, a tetrahedron or something like that, the shadow that the sun uh, cast on the moon would be this shape. If the earth were pyramidal, the shadow would be this shape. If the Earth were a cube, you'd get a shadow like that. But in fact, the Earth is round, and so you get a shadow like that. Uh, so it's, it's, not, uh, it's not, um, certainly not, uh, not the case that everybody knew the world was round, but it was, it was well known. And in fact, as long ago as 200 BC, a fellow named Eratosthenes was able to actually measure, to come up with a pretty good estimate of the the actual circumference of the Earth. And this is the way he did that. This is uh, Egypt, and he understood, he knew that in Syene, a place uh, which is actually very close to the Aswan Dam, uh, there was a well. And on uh, a certain day of the year, the sun was said to be directly above that well. And you knew that because if you looked down this very deep well in the desert, you could see the reflection of the sun. So he did an experiment uh, by, he lived, at, uh, Eratosthenes lived in Alexandria, and he did an experiment in which on the same day that that well was supposed to be illuminated in that way, he measured the angle uh, of the shadow cast by a pole, a perpendicular pole in Alexandria. And through some fairly elementary mathematics, he assumed, he assumed that in fact, uh, they were more or less on, on a north-south line, and in fact, they are more or less on a south-west, a north-south line. And so he did this experiment. Here's a, here's a side view of what he did. Here's the well. Actually, this is graduated in miles. It's about 480 miles. And here in Alexandria, when the sun is, the sun's rays, of course, are absolutely parallel because the sun is so far away and the earth is so small by comparison. 
So when the sun's rays penetrated to the bottom of the well in Syene, they cast a shadow this big in Alexandria. And the, the geometry of it is pretty simple. Um, you measure, if you measure the angle cast by the shadow, it's the same as this angle here, uh, this sector of the Earth. And he calculated that that was 7.5, 7.2 degrees, or a 50th of a circle. So if you take, uh, it was, he reckoned the distance as 5,000 stadia. Um, if you take uh, 5,000 stadia and multiply it by 50, you get, uh, you get a figure which translated into miles is about 24,860 or 24,000 miles, and the actual figure is 24,860. So he's, he's off by 9%, but I think, you know, a pretty reasonable calculation considering the instrumentation he had available. We're going to move now quickly to the first, uh, the first really important and in, in many ways the most influential cartographer who ever lived, and that's Claudius Ptolemy. He lived in the uh, second century A.D., uh, worked right around 125 A.D. Uh, of course, we don't really know what he looked like, but this is a, a, a 16th century uh, Im, uh, imaginary portrait. And Ptolemy uh, was, a, was a polymath. He wrote uh, treatises on astronomy, on music, on mathematics. He's actually most known as an astronomer, probably. But one of the treatises he wrote was called Geographia, on geography. And by which, uh, by which he meant the mapping of the world, geography, the writing of the world. And he conceived, he knew, of course, the world, the earth was round, and he uh, was a sphere, and he conceived that the, and this was the general Greek view, that the, the area in which people lived, the oikumene, was one quarter of a sphere. And they assumed, they knew a little bit about uh, about what was down here. Well, actually, they didn't, because here's the top part of Africa. They really didn't know much about that. But they assumed that there had to be four other pieces uh, of, of a landscape uh, on this globe to, to balance it out. So he came up with, uh, one of the things he invented was this projection. This is called Ptolemy's first projection. It's a cylindrical projection, and it shows 180 degrees from his western end, which was the Fortunate Isles. People aren't sure whether, some people think it was uh, the Canaries and Madeira. Some people think it was Cape Verde. But whatever it was, it was sort of the farthest out thing in the Atlantic that Ptolemy and other Greek geographers knew of. And he drew it 180 degrees, in other words, halfway around the globe. And his, the extent north and south is from a little bit north of 60 degrees the parallel of Thule to uh, the parallel opposite Mero. Mero is a town in, in uh, North Sudan, or was a town in North Sudan at about 15 degrees uh, uh, below the equator. There's the, there's the equator. No, I'm sorry, there's the equinox line. Uh, the, we're, we're, we're all north of the equator here. So uh, his uh, second projection is a little more suggests a little more the globular shape. This is Ptolemy's second projection. And this is the world map that he came up with. Um, and it shows, you know, the 180 degrees. Here are the fortunate isles out here, whatever they are. And you notice Africa is, it's pretty unknown down here. All he knew about was this part. And the assumption was that the, uh, the Indian Ocean was a, was a closed sea. Um, just to orient you a little bit, and of course, orient comes from the fact that many older maps were oriented with east at the top, hence orient. But uh, to uh, put you in the picture a little bit, this is this uh, sort of misshapen thing is the Indian subcontinent, and this is uh, the island of Sri Lanka, Ceylon. Uh, this is probably the Malay Peninsula. So uh, he came up with a, a world map and also uh, 26 regional maps. He made a map of, um, he made uh, 10 maps of Europe, four maps of Africa, and 12 maps of Asia. Now, how did he 
place things. He talks actually about how, how to make a map, and the first thing he says is, well, because the Earth is round, you really should start with a big ball. But that's kind of difficult. It would be hard for us today, too, to, make, to start with a big blank ball. So, and then he said the next best thing is to start with a slice of a ball. You know, so you have a big curved surface like that. And then you can make your map on that. But he says that also is difficult. So let's, let's just work with flat paper. So he comes up with these two projections. And he proceeds to plot on them all the places he knew about uh, in the world. One of the, one, uh, one of the main tools that would have been available at that time was a quadrant looking more or less like this, a device that you could sight through on this side and a little weighted plum hung down. And if you sighted, say, the North Star, that would read directly to your latitude. Latitude was relatively easy. And in, in the ancient world, there, some astronomers had very huge uh, models of these things, very large operational quadrants. And they could probably read quite, quite accurately the latitude. Uh, another way that he determined how far north and south a place was by knowing something about the difference between the longest, uh, the length of day and the length of night. Um, at the equator, uh, it's equal. You know, the day, a day is as, as long as a night. Uh, at cer uh, yes, uh, at certain times of the year. Um, but then as you go north, uh, here's the, the uh, day of Miro, that place in northern Sudan. There's a one-hour difference between the longest day and the shortest day. Uh, at uh, Sayin, uh, a place in southern Egypt, uh, there's a, a two-hour difference. At Alexandria, it's about three and a half. Uh, by the time you get up here to the far north, like Denmark, it's about nine hours or more. So he, this is the kind of information he would have gathered from Roman legions operating in England and Germany and Spain and France, how long the longest day was in various places. So that would be how he would, how he would, uh, would set his, uh, his latitude. So here he's, this is how he would plot the latitude. of. He knew that, that Alexandria was uh, 31 degrees north. He knew that quite accurately. He calculated that it was about 60 degrees and 30 minutes east of the Fortunate Islands. Now, how would he have known that? He talks about one way, of course, longitude is time. Uh, one hour of time is 15 minutes of longitude. And what we, we learned, we know now that the, the most accurate way to understand longitude is to be able to carry an accurate clock from one place to another. And of course, it took it took thousands of years for that just to be finalized. It wasn't until John Harrison in the 1780s that they actually had a chronometer accurate enough to carry time that way. But even in Ptolemy's day, he, he was aware of other solutions. He said if you had accurate information about the timing of eclipses, if you knew that, uh, that an eclipse uh, observed over here in Damascus happened at midnight and it happened and it was observed at like 1.30 in the morning in Alexandria or I don't know in in Cadiz or something then you would be able to use that as a as an uh, instant of time and calculate the distance so you and he had some information like that there was there was a little bit of information about eclipses but there had a lot of information had been gathered about the distances of places of course the Romans were wandering all over the, uh, their empire. And uh, they were very active in, in Britain uh, a little before Ptolemy's time. And so a place like London uh, was, was nailed down. And it's probable that most of Ptolemy's longitudes are actually uh, cobbled together from distance measurements. So from Alexandria here, he would have, of course, he had access to the Alexandrian library, which was full of information and access, presumably, to all sorts of Roman records and itineraries and things like that, uh, virtually all of which is lost to us now. But he knew that, for instance, if you went from Alexandria to Algiers or Tunis, 
that it took, uh, that it was so far, you know, they reckoned it was so many Roman miles. He actually had a system whereby if he had, a, if he had an itinerary distance between two places, he knew, of course, that they were, any road is going to be a little windy, he, he allowed for one-fifth error. So he said you know, if he had a distance of, of uh, there was 500 uh, stadia or 500 Roman miles, say, from Alexandria to Tunis, he said, well, okay, I'm going to count that as 400. And then he would establish the, the, uh, the uh, uh, longitude of Tunis or of London or of some other city. So in a very, in a very um, slow and painstaking way, I'd like to actually, I like to envision Ptolemy as working on a one huge map, maybe on a wall or maybe even more conveniently on a floor like this, and having drawn out his projection and saying, okay, here's Alexandria, um, and I know Damascus is this far away, and, uh, and it's at this uh, uh, latitude, then I'm going to say it's here, and gradually shifting back and forth and moving things around, he came up with his world map, which you saw earlier. Um, just a sort of a, a sideline, in a way, about the discovery of America. Ptolemy's, this is a globe made in 1492 by a German named Martin Beheim, who was working in Portugal. Now, there's no, there's no evidence that Columbus ever saw this globe, although if there was one globe, there may have been more. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't a unique object. So it's not at all unlikely that he saw this globe or, or something like it, you know. At least he was, this was a con uh, concept that was clearly out there. And basically what this globe does is it takes Ptolemy's world and wraps it around a globe. It happens, though, that because Ptolemy actually didn't accept Eratosthenes' uh, measurement, apparently, for the size of the globe. For, I, don't, I don't remember what the reasons were, but he posited a somewhat smaller sphere for the Earth. And he actually exa he ended up exaggerating the longitud longitudinal length of the oikumene. So when you wrap Ptolemy's a little too large Earth around a little too small globe, you get a, what we would call, Pacific Ocean view that looks like this. This is a projection of the Beheim globe uh, looking with Europe over here, and here's China, and these islands off of China, maybe that uh, could be the Philippines or, you know, there's some idea of that. Here's Sipangu, which is Japan. This is all information that came from Marco Polo. But what you can see is, I love this example because it shows you exactly what Columbus thought he was doing. When he sailed uh, from Spain, his idea was to sail west until, and these are the islands, the Canaries and the other islands in the Atlantic, was to sail past all those islands until he hit other islands off the coast of China. And indeed, he thought when he hit Hispaniola and uh, those other places that these, those were some of these islands. And that's, I believe the story is that Columbus actually went to his grave thinking that he had, in fact, discovered these, these uh, East Indies. So um, I'll, I want to show you in a little more detail uh, how Ptolemy went about mapping, uh, one of it, making one of his detailed maps. Uh, Ptolemy's first map of Europe uh, is the British Isles. And interestingly, the... The, his, his arrangement of these regional maps, starting with the British Isles and the second map being the Iberian Peninsula, that tradition became very firmly entrenched so that when the first modern atlas came out in 1570, Abraham Ortelius, he had a world map, and then his first regional map was the British Isles, and the second regional map was Iberia. And in fact, most atlases made until the 20, 20th century followed that, that pattern. At least. That was, it, was, it was Great Britain, it was, uh, it was uh, Spain, then it was France, and then so on. The order kind of falls apart after that, but that's, that was a, how influential Ptolemy was. So this is a satellite view of, of, uh, of Great Britain, and this is Ptolemy's map of Great Britain. And uh, this is the kind of information that, that uh, Ptolemy recorded. Lots of place names uh, of towns, um, a number of locations of rivers. Uh, this interior, we're not to take 
this interior detail at all seriously, but uh, supposedly the river mouth is, it would have been, so, it's something that he plotted. Um, there are some names of peoples here, a sort of general names. This is where the, I can't read these names on here, but this is where this tribe lives and this is where these people live. And a few physical features like some mountains and even a big forest here in Scotland. So how did he do that? Well, he started with a projection of that part of the world, and he put down his best guess as to where London was located, latitude and longitude. The British, uh, um, the, uh, the Roman legions, of course, were all over Great Britain, and they undoubtedly had regular travel between all these places, and he had itineraries telling him how far certain things were, especially towns. Uh, Tamara, actually, I think, is a river in Cornwall. Uh, Corinium is, I have to look at my crib sheet, Corinium is Cirencester. Um, Maridunum is uh, Carmarthen in Wales. Uh, this is the promontory of Kent, which was apparently fairly well established because it was where the, the Roman, uh, Roman troops, the Roman ships would, would that would be the first la uh, landfall there in Britain. And so he, there were a number of places that he had fair ratier, is uh, Leicester, uh, Diva is Cheshire, uh, Lindum is Lincoln, and Eboracum is York. And he, he adds the note in his geography that this is where the Sixth Legion uh, won a victory. So uh, there were a number of places that he was able to establish fairly accurately in relation to one another where they were. And from these from some of these fixed locations. Some people even think that the Romans had a kind of a triangulation, had a kind of a, a standard triangle that they worked off of here in, in surveying, in making maps of England. And Ptolemy may actually have had a map of England that, that he got from, from someone in the army. Uh, it's not at all unthinkable um, that there was a sketch map and they said, yeah, well, this is what this southwest promontory looks like. So anyway, using the best information he had, he came up with this outline on his big map. Let's picture it on the floor here. And he also put in the river mouths. Uh, you know, they said, well, this river is up here so many miles north of this point here. And, you know, and so he plotted all these places on his map. Now, if he had just done that and made these wonderful maps, uh, that would have been enough had they survived. But the problem with maps then and uh, still today is that they're extremely fragile and extremely subject to wear and tear. And any of you who have a, a car with a glove compartment, you can uh, testify that, in fact, most maps get used to death if they're, if they're used at all. So uh, had Ptolemy made a big world map on parchment or on papyrus or something, and had he made a set of 26 regional maps, maybe they would have survived, maybe copies would have been made, and they would have survived the millennia. But, uh, and he undoubtedly did make such maps. I mean, he at least made one big map, we know that. But the reason Ptolemy's geography survived is because he digitized it. He took, he took all of these, he started with these latitudes and longitudes of towns, and then he started plotting the reading off of, his, of his, his base map on the floor, let's say. He started reading off uh, other coordinates. So if you'll follow these dots that I've placed around here, he would say, okay, well, at this, this point of this bulge, it's uh, 53 degrees, 30 minutes uh, of... Uh, of latitude and about uh, 22 degrees, 10 minutes of longitude. And he'd write that down. And he'd, he'd do this for the river mouths, for the promontories, for all these different features around the island. And he came up with um, dozens, uh, perhaps as many as a couple hundred points uh, for the British Isles. And he recorded those in tabular format like this. Uh, this is, happens to be a Latin manuscript of Ptolemy's geography. He, he would have written in Greek, and there are some extant Greek manuscripts. But basically, Ptolemy's geography, as we know it, as it came down 
through the ages consisted of no maps, but a, a textbook of how to, do, how to do the projections and a general description of how to map and a list of 8,000 coordinates like this. Here's a place. Here's the latitude and fraction and longitude and fraction. And actually, the way he indicated uh, uh, min uh, degrees, I mean, uh, minutes and, and, well, he didn't really get into seconds, but the way he indicated uh, minutes was he would say if it was, f we would call it 50 degrees, 30 minutes, he would say 50 degrees and a half. And if it was 50 degrees, 45 minutes, he would say 50 degrees and a half and a quarter. Uh, they didn't have the concept of uh, unified fraction. So the, the geography, as it came down through the ages, consisted of just uh, uh, data, just um, a numeric da alpha numeric data, digital data, if you will. And it wasn't, uh, that there, seems, there is some evidence that the Arabs uh, had access to Ptolemy's geography, but it was pretty much lost to Western culture until the late 1200s, I'm sorry, the late 1300s, when a copy was discovered in uh, Constantinople, a Greek manuscript. And a geographer in Constantinople said, hmm, here's a direction for how to make a world map. And he proceeded to plot out these eight having drawn we don't know if he did one big map or made regional maps, but he followed Ptolemy's instructions. He plotted out all these 8,000 places and produced this atlas. Well, that was a revolutionary thing. And that atlas very quickly got translated into Latin, and many, many copies were made of it, and it became, it became the first standard atlas of the world. This in about 1400. And it in many ways, it stayed the standard atlas of the world for at least 100 years. Uh, Ptolemy's geography was one of the first books to be published. Uh, the first edition with maps was 1477, a very early illustrated book. And it were multiple editions all through the 16th century. It wasn't until about 15, in 1570 when Ortelius came out with his Theatrum Orbis Terrarum. That's thought of as the first modern atlas. But until that time, at least until the 1520s, Ptolemy's maps from 125 AD were pretty much it for understanding the geography of the world. Of course, they, when the new discoveries happened, they had to, they had to think on their feet. And there's a, there are several maps. Uh, uh, there's one map in particular I'm thinking of in the exhibit where you see what's basically a Ptolemaic world with uh, some American stuff tacked on it. Uh, but to get back to, um, to his map of Britain, many of you may have wondered why Scotland is bent over like that. Um, I, I, I've, I haven't read actually anywhere anyone saying this explicitly, but I'm pretty convinced this is what happened. If you turn that bit of Scotland up on end like this, 90 degrees, you'll see that it actually is not a bad uh, rendition of Scotland. I mean, you get the basic... Uh, peninsula up here, this uh, Moray Firth, you get this peninsula here, these little fjord-like things over on the west side. Uh, it's, it's not bad for uh, 125 AD, drawn by a guy a couple thousand miles away who never left Alexandria, uh, working from verbal uh, descriptions, probably. But the reason uh, he had to bend it was because of the island of Thule. You remember that, that zonal diagram? It showed the sort of northernmost habitable place as uh, the, the latitude of Thule. Well, Thule, uh, this is from a, a map of 1539 showing this imaginary island. Uh, some people think it actually might have been Iceland um, or possibly some other uh, faraway island in the North Atlantic. But uh, basically, Ptolemy's information went back to Pythias, who said that Thule was six days' sail north of Britain and is near the frozen sea. And the idea was that when you got that far north, much beyond, uh, beyond 60 degrees north, that it, the entire sea was frozen and it would obviously be uninhabitable. So um, Ptolemy was, was uh, in a pickle because he had, he had a lot of information from the Roman legions about Britain and about Scotland, and he clearly knew that when you got up here, 
there was still about this much more to go. But he had the problem that here was his Thule. He had, he had plotted Thule as this location. And according to Pythias, uh, it, just, it, had to be, it had to be six days sail north of Britain. And if he put it up this way, it just didn't fit. So he did, he did what um, I, yeah, a lot of scientists do today. They try to, they try to uh, adjust, the, you know, understand the data in the, in the way that's most, that seems to make the most sense. And for him, he tries to preserve the length of Britain while at the same time recognizing that Thule is pretty much the northern limit of, of habitation. So he simply bent it. That's my view, and I challenge anyone, to, if anyone has another explanation, <laughs> they're welcome to give it. So anyway, this is Ptolemy's world, uh, the same world that's wrapped around that Beheim globe, although uh, the Beheim globe also includes information from Marco Polo, which extends uh, China out here and gives us Japan. Uh, moving now to uh, the, the middle, uh, to the uh, Mediterranean, um, we're going to talk about another uh, great Ptolemy's, the, the discovery of Ptolemy's geography in, in 1400 or thereabouts is, uh, is just a, an epic, epical thing in the history of cartography. It, the whole idea of, of mapping on a, on a grid, latitude and longitude, that all comes from, from Ptolemy. But there was another tradition that had started um, a couple hundred years earlier that in the Mediterranean that is even, uh, that is it's sort of a parallel tradition. And that's the tradition of the Portolan chart. Um, this is the first, uh, the earliest known copy of a Portolan chart. And some of the characteristics of Portolan charts, well, they're almost always drawn on an animal skin, on vellum. Uh, this is the neck of the animal. Um, if you can, can you see the outline here? Here, this is that we're looking at the Mediterranean. Down here is the, uh, uh, the uh, Strait of Gibraltar. Um, and here's North Africa. Here's the Italian, the boot of Italy. Uh, here's the eastern, uh, the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. And actually, the Black Sea was almost always included <coughs> in portal on charts. Uh, and the Black Sea has been somewhat eroded here. Actually, this, this map, one of the most uh, important maps in the history of cartography, was found in a Paris junk shop in 1840-something. Uh, and uh, it now lives in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Here's a detail of, um, of the carte paysanne, as it's called, which shows you uh, in, in greater detail some of the characteristics. Portal and charts invariably have a circle, a, a circular grid. If you, if you step back, you can actually see, um, you can see a couple of, uh, of great, sort of great circles here inscribed that, that have wind, wind roses in the middle and radiating, uh, radiating wind lines or rum lines as they're called, R-H-U-M-B. Um, the place names on portal and charts are always written inland. They tried to leave the water spaces as open as possible. Um, typically, the rum lines were different colors. Some were green, some were red. Some charts have black ones. Um, another characteristic, oh, they, have, uh, they, show, uh, they show tiny little rocks. There's another example. That, uh, I can show you some more symbols. But, um, and the other thing is that there is no up on a Portland chart. There's just no, you can't say, oh, this is, this is meant to be up. The lettering, if you'll see, this, these are meant to be read from, from that way. And then down here, I can't quite make that out. They're still read that way, but over here, they're read this way. And if you go around an island, you have to kind of, you, so you'd have to kind of turn the chart around like that. So it didn't really have, it didn't really have an, a natural up. Um, this is a, another Portland chart. This is from the Newberry's collection. This is our earliest Portland. We have a a couple dozen Portland charts and atlases. Um, this is 1456, done by a, a Rosselli from Mallorca. He signs it up here in the neck. And uh, again, it's the, it's the outline of, of the Mediterranean with the Black Sea. Some of them also went up, most of them went up the west coast of Europe, included the British Isles, usually. Um, very often they would put these maps uh, these uh, flags around the around the border. Um, 
I, this, uh, many of the Portland charts that have survived, obviously the, the carte paysanne is a pretty, pretty tattered and torn thing and d was not probably terribly attractive when it was made. Uh, some of the Portland charts that have survived are very pristine, lovely things that probably were made for, for uh, uh, you know, rich clients or for parlor use or library use. But uh, there are some that give evidence of having been to sea, and I think this is one of them. Over here on this side, there are these holes. That's where it was nailed onto a wooden roller. And over here on the neck is a little hole. There would have been a leather thong through there, so you'd roll it up and tie it with that thong and stick it in a cubby hole on, on board ship. Uh, and it's definitely seen some wear here from being rolled and unrolled, and even some of these flags have obvious signs of, of the ink, the, the the uh, pigment having having gotten wet. So I don't know. I like to think this one may actually have gone to sea. Anyway, how were they used? This is another Portland atlas from the Newberry. I've, it's actually a, uh, this is a, uh, an atlas. This is an opening of two pages. I've had to join the, the sheets here, uh, the, the uh, digital copies. But to show you um, how a mariner might use a Portland chart like this, uh, if you wanted to go from this uh, Mel Melilla, I think it is, on the north coast of Africa to uh, this point over here, Cabo de da Gata, Gata uh, Cap, uh, Cape of Cat Cape. Um, he, in other words, he wanted to sail a course more or less like that. He could draw his course on there or lay a, lay a parallel ruler between those places. Uh, there's one side of the parallel ruler, and then he'd swing out the other arm of the ruler until he until he lined it up with a windrose. And in this case, as you can see, the, that's the north line, north by east, north, northeast. It's actually in between north by east and north, northeast. So uh, the mariner starting out from here would try to get his compass to, uh, to be read a little bit uh, east of north by east and hopefully would, would strike uh, this point. Uh, but not, uh, hopefully not, um, not literally, because as a matter of fact, there's, a, um, there's an indication here that there's a big rock there. And I think if, you, if you're familiar with modern nautical charts, I think something very like that is used today to indicate uh, a, 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 this, uh, a hazard to navigation, like a rock. Uh, little dots like this to indicate shoals. Some of these Portland charts even have a little ship's skeleton to indicate a, a wreck, a sunken ship. Uh, so the main tool was uh, a compass, uh, such as this one. Uh, we don't really have any really ancient compasses. The compass was, uh, they used to say that it was invented in China and carried to the Mediterranean. Now people think that it may have been independently invented. But anyway, there's, there's textual evidence that people talking about sailing with compasses, uh, sailing by the ma magnetized needle in the uh, early 1200s. And so that's about the time the carte pisan comes out, sometime in the late 1200s. Um, the earliest compasses may have been just a, a needle actually floating on water, held up by surface tension. Sometimes they would push the needle through a straw, uh, and that would keep it afloat. But I, I'm sure by a very early age, they had, they had devised this method of a, of a card uh, with the needle attached underneath. And uh, they would have needed an hourglass, or in some cases, uh, a minute glass or a half minute glass. And navigators from uh, at least the late Middle Ages up until well into the uh, 18th, 18th century were using a log and line to, to uh, gather information about their speed. Uh, basically, you needed, you needed uh, a, a spool with a lot of line on it. Uh, you needed this log here, or, or chip, and you needed a, uh, a glass that was good for half a minute. And the way it worked was something like this. I think you must have needed a, at least three men. Uh, one, one guy is holding this, the log reel. Another guy is holding the 30-second glass. And another guy is holding the, uh, the actual chip here, which is weighted at the bottom. He throws this thing over, over the back of the ship. And it hits the water and starts bobbing along. And of course, the water catches it here, so it's, it's 
sort of riding up in the water. And he waits until uh, about the length of the ship. There's a red rag tied there. And that indicates that the, the thing is now far enough behind the ship so that it's, it's free of the wake of the ship. And supposedly, it's, it's kind of digging into more untroubled waters. And at that, when that red line goes over, the, um, goes over the, the rail, he says, turn. And the guy with the, gla with the 30 second glass turns the glass. And then they start counting how many knots go over. And the knots are placed, well, apparently there were a couple different uh, lengths of knot. But the knots are placed at regular intervals along there. And you count how many knots go over. And when the, when the glass runs out, the guy says, stop. And then they, the guy holding the reel holds it. They count how many knots have gone over, and they record that information on this device, which is a traverse board. And this is a, a wonderfully simple device that um, didn't, didn't require any great learning. An illiterate, illiterate seaman could, uh, could use it as long as he uh, was familiar with the points of the compass and could read the numbers, I guess, from 1 to 12. Um, the idea is this. Here are all the points of the compass that you could possibly s steer. Each of these concentric rows of circles is a half hour. So this would be the first half hour of a watch, the second half hour, the third half hour, and so on, up to the four hour watch. A very standard uh, way of breaking up the day at sea from early, from early on. And attached to the middle, there is a cord. And you have a bunch of little pegs uh, to go along with it, which you can push uh, next to the cord into a hole. So what this tells us is that in the first half hour of the watch, they were sailing north by west on that course. And in the second half hour of the watch, they were still sailing north by west. But when the third half hour came along, they had shifted their course to this point of the compass. And in the fourth half hour, after two hours of sailing, they had shifted it to this point. So you'd keep doing this. And for the four hours of a watch, you'd have a perfect record of the course you had steered. Now, how fast were you going? Well, every hour, they would do this business with the log, uh, the chip log. And down, they would plot those down here. Each of these lines is one hour of the watch. That's the first hour, the second hour, third hour, the fourth hour. What this tells us is that in the first hour of the watch, they were going six knots. So they put the little peg there. In the second hour of the watch, I'm, I'm doing all this pointing, and I made this elaborate slide to, to show you this. <laughs> I forgot about it. Um, so there's the first hour, six knots. In the second hour, eight knots. But a little more than eight knots. In fact, eight and a half knots. They could record down to the quarter, quarter of a knot. So that's a fairly good, uh, a fairly accurate estimate of your speed. So at the end of a, uh, of a four-hour watch, the seaman could hand this, uh, this board over to the captain or whoever was keeping the records. And they would have a complete record of distance and direction and speed uh, for, for that watch, which they could write down into a log. Well, um, how did Portland? I, I see Jeff looking at his watch. Yeah, OK, that clock is right. I'm doing all right. Um, how, did, uh, how, did the, uh, how did this information get recorded? Ultimately, a lot of, a lot of this of Siemens information about distances from ports and things like that got recorded in, in itinerary form like this. It, it strictly. Uh, well, I will say I will call it again a digital a digital record. I mean, it it certainly it uses numbers. Here's a Roman uh, there are Roman numerals in here, and uh, alphanumeric characters to record certain information. And this is the kind of information they record. These are called uh, portolani, uh, port books of books of sailing directions between ports. And this is a, a w the most famous portolani. Uh, is uh, the Compasso de Navigare from the, again, the late uh, uh, 1200s. And here's just one, uh, one of the indications. They go from Fanaro, this port, to Felia. It's 30 miles to the northwest. And then there's sometimes notes about 
about the, the place. But it's just one thing like that after another going around the whole course of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. That's what's in the Compasso del Navagare. Now, people have long uh, imagined that there had to be some connection between these, these portolani, these books of, of directions like that, and the finished portolan charts. But it wasn't until a couple decades ago that a, a retired physician, uh, Jonathan Landman, actually took the trouble to convert all of the measurements, all of the information in the Compasso da Navagare into, into distances, standard distances, and directions. He took, and when he read northwest, he turned that into so many degrees. When he read north by northwest, he, he converted that into so many degrees. And then he plotted down the distances and those bearings uh, and started to see what would happen. And in fact, he discovered that the Compasso da Navagari, if you plot down all those distances and directions, it does, in fact, I didn't mean to do that. What do I do? Just do this? Yeah. It does, in fact, generate a map of the Mediterranean. Now, of course, it didn't, it didn't come out exactly like this. Any of you know anything about surveying know that there's something called error of closure. Whenever you survey around an area, um, you're not gonna, it's not going to end up perfectly like that. In fact, some of, you know, this may be way down here or something. But as long as you're working with a, with a closed area, and this is virtually closed here at the Strait of Gibraltar, uh, you know how to adjust it. So you just kind of adjust a little bit on every, on every angle to make, it, to make it fit like this. Well, how, how close was it? Well, it was pretty close. There's the modern outline of the Mediterranean. So um, we're pretty sure this is how the basic portolan chart was generated from these, from these tables, really, uh, or verbal lists of distances and directions. And of course, it didn't happen all at once like that. You know, it wasn't that somebody, there was this suddenly this uh, a Compasso de Navagari and somebody took that and plotted it and uh, voila, portolan chart. I mean, it must have been a long procedure involving many, many, error, many errors and many many partial uh, maps, I suppose, of different areas. But uh, it's pretty clear, I think, that that is the, that is the, the source. Um, and, and now I'm going to say a little bit about a more continental uh, approach. We, the, the, uh, the Mediterranean, we discovered, is pretty much mapped through very accurate, uh, very small scale uh, uh, measurements of distance and direction around the perimeter. Um, much the same thing, using many of the same instruments, is happening on a larger scale when we come to a continent. We've already seen one early map of this part of Africa. Now we're going to look at, the, at the, um, uh, some of the Portuguese efforts to map the west coast of Africa. Now one other instrument that would have been involved besides the, uh, the quadrant that we saw, uh, Ptolemy was holding a quadrant, uh, there was uh, an instrument called the cross staff, which is, works the same way. It, you, you sight an object and you, you align this bar of this thing with the horizon and this top of the bar with whatever you're sighting, north star or sun, and you, you read an angle off of this sliding bar. Um, there's a model in the exhibit here. There are lots of wonderful um, instruments in this exhibit uh, that are some of which I've never seen before, very neat addition to the exhibit. And in there is a, is a back staff, which is the same principle as this cross staff, but instead of having to look directly at the sun, you, uh, you turn your back to the sun, and this has an, a little mirror on it here, or a little vein, and you can read the shadow, uh, the, uh, the shadow of the sun instead of directly. But it accomplishes the same thing. So using um, logs and lines and um, uh, measure, uh, instruments like the quadrant or the, or the cross staff to measure latitude, um, the Portuguese gradually began to map Africa. Now this is a, a portion of a 1489 map, and I've trimmed everything else away except what Ptolemy knew. This is pretty much the Africa that Ptolemy knew. It consisted of the north 
the north coast here, the the uh, north shore of the Mediterranean. He knew about he knew about the Atlas Mountains. Uh, he knew about the Nile, and they knew or thought they knew that the Nile had its source in the Mountains of the Moon, somewhere way down south in Africa. They also knew or thought they knew uh, about some big lakes here, which I have no doubt were uh, uh, Lake Victoria and Lake Nyasaland, you know, or whatever those lakes are. Um, just, you know, the word was there were big lakes down there at the, Ni at the towards the end of the Nile. Uh, so that was Ptolemy's Africa. Well, by the time the Portuguese really started to make a, uh, a dedicated effort to get a to try to see if they could get around Africa, if it was in fact um, not, if it in fact did not enclose the the Indian Ocean, um, they started to sail down the west coast. And uh, this is this was a very long process. I mean, uh, 1432, another uh, few years later, they get a little further to the River of Gold. Um, now we're 10 years later. Uh, here we're a long time later. It took the Portuguese uh, something like 50 years to get, uh, to get the, the bulge of Africa really nailed down. Uh, but, and so they would have done this in exactly the same way by getting, uh, by getting uh, latitude readings on these various river mouths and things like that, and then by keeping track of their distances and directions. And finally, the big push to see if they couldn't get around the continent. And in 1485, no, 1487, 8, Bartolomeo Diaz actually rounds the Cape of Good Hope and gets as far as the Great Fish River, where he can see the coastline trending north. So this is the Africa that, that is known after Diaz's expedition, 1488. And in fact, this map is a world map made by a German called Henricus Martellus in 1489. This is a manuscript uh, at the British Library. There's another copy of the Martellus map with, with very much the same geography. Uh, at Yale. And of course you can see the, uh, this is still Ptolemy's truncated South Asia and his very huge uh, Ceylon, Taprobana. And the, but here it, it does have some indication that there is, uh, from Marco Polo, that there are these islands off the coast of China. So that is, um, that is how continents are mapped in a very basic way. And that is how North America ultimately was mapped too. Now I want to conclude with a, uh, a case study of how, how the interior of continents might have been mapped. And, uh, or, or was in this case, how it was mapped. This is, these are the Great Lakes, of course. And um, I think you can see that it would be, it would be a much different uh, proposition to try to map the Great Lakes by coming in here and making a circuit of the lake and then measuring this distance down here and then making a circuit of this lake and circuit of this lake and stringing those all together into a, you know, in the way we did with the Mediterranean, that would have been a tall order. And in fact, it, it didn't happen because the only people uh, on these lakes for hundreds of years were voyagers in, in birch bark canoes. So, you ended up with fairly crude maps of the Great Lakes. This is actually the first map to show all five of the Great Lakes. And you can see it, Lake Superior, they obviously were up here in, uh, in uh, near the Straits of Mackinac, and they knew there was a big lake opening up there, but they didn't know how big or where it ended. This is presumably Lake Michigan, although Lac de Puan, the name of Green Bay, is usually Bay de Puan. Uh, so that would be Lake Michigan. Huron, Ontario, and Erie. But I'm showing you a series of maps that attempt to represent the Great Lakes to show you that uh, there's no such thing as, as uh, nice linear progressions in cartography. We like to think that in general, you know, every map is an improvement on the last map. And, you know, and, and I suppose in, in, some, in some cases that is the case. 
but uh, if you look at a lot of early maps, you'll see a lot of, a lot of stumbling, a lot of uh, just plain, you know, I don't know, making things up. Um, cartographers have always borrowed wildly from other cartographers. I mean, until, until very recently when we can actually go to something like Google Earth or NASA and get, or the sub, uh, digital image laboratory and get up-to-date photographs of the Earth's surface. Until very recently, when a cartographer was asked to make a map of such and such area, the first thing he did was find another map of that area and use it as a base map and maybe adapt it or change the scale or something like that. Most maps are actually made from other maps. And at this time, too, people were copying each other. So as we go through these various images of the Great Lakes, you'll see some, uh, some things that look the same. You'll say, oh, that, that looks like he copied that from so-and-so. One of the things that I'm always interested in is, th is when it comes to the Great Lakes, if you can define the shape of Michigan, both its southern peninsula and its northern peninsula, you have almost completed a map of the Great Lakes. Uh, and if you'll, you'll watch Michigan through this series of slides, I think you'll see that uh, it was a very hard little peninsula to map. Ac surprisingly, th one, this is a nice example of how uh, progression is not linear in cartography. This happens to be a very early, in fact, the first map of Lake Superior, 1671. We know it was done by the Jesuits. It's published in the Jesuit relations. We don't really know who did it. Uh, Father Alouez was one. I think Father Marquette may actually have been involved. He was up here at, at the mission on the Apostle Island. But it's actually a very accurate map of, of Lake Superior. It has Isle Royale here. Uh, it has just a couple of little minor islands that are actually there. And, and we, the reason they were able to do this is we know that the Jesuits actually made a pretty much complete circuit of, of the lake in canoes, counting, counting, or counting paddle strokes perhaps, I don't know, but estimating the distance in some way and taking uh, readings of, of latitude with an astrolabe or with a quadrant. Um, here again, uh, Michigan is, is a little distorted. Look at, look at Lake Michigan. On many of these early maps, it, I, actually there are some where it's, it's swinging way this way, Somewhere it's almost straight up and down, and somewhere it's way over at this angle. Mi Michigan is, is like a pendulum. Um, Frank Lalonde, very influential French map maker, he seems to have, have relied, I think, a little bit on the Jesuit map. He knew about it anyway. Um, Coronelli, uh, Italian cartographer, 1680s. Uh, this is, looks like it's copied from the Jesuit map, except for some reason he thought he had to make it much wider. Um, some fairly uh, some fairly outlandish figures here. Uh, where this comes from? Uh, this is the beginning of the of adding islands to Lake Superior in the uh, in the late 17th century. There were a couple of French manuscript maps made that s just suddenly put in imaginary islands and named them after influential characters in France. <laughs> and those islands got picked up on later maps. It's always the bad stuff that gets copied first. So um, this, these, these depictions, I don't know where they come from. Hennepin was generally not considered a very reliable uh, traveler or cartographer. Um, Delisle was, was one of the best map makers. And actually, it's not a bad representation of the Great Lakes. He's clearly using the Jesuit map here for Lake Superior. And Lake Michigan is actually fairly reasonably oriented. Um, Herman Maul, one of the more uh, imaginative uh, cartographers. Uh, Captain Cyprian Southack, the first, first map of North America published in America, published in Boston in 1717. But where he got his Great Lakes from, I do not know. <laughs> Very strange. Uh, I don't think there was a model for that. Um, Popple, uh, a part of Henry Popple's map, the Southern Sheets, showing the Gulf of Mexico is in the exhibit. Uh, one, of the, one of the best maps of uh, North America in the 18th century. A yeah, fairly reasonable uh, Michigan and Lake Michigan, but notice Lake Superior. Here he's got uh, Isle, this is Isle Royale, and then here's Isle 
Filippo, uh, Pontchartrain, and I can't quite read it, but uh, there were three or four or five islands just thrown in there to flatter the uh, French, French officials. Uh, in fact, each one is named after another official. So It's nice to have an island named after you. Um, here again, Lake Michigan, way off to the southwest, and Michigan Peninsula, just a little point. Uh, this is the Mitchell map, uh, on the second, maybe the most important 18th century map of North America. It's been called the most, most important map in American history, uh, largely because this is the map that in 1783 was laying in front of the, the commissioners in Paris who drew the Treaty of Peace, and they, put the, they drew a red line on this map showing the border dividing the United States from the British colony. Uh, Mitchell's map is interesting in that this is, the, uh, the, this is actually the Newberry's copy, badly reproduced, but um, our copy is colored so that you can see that the, uh, the um, colonies were, at least the southern colonies, were shown with their western borders extending to the Pacific according to the colonial charters. There's a wonderful copy of the Mitchell map uh, upstairs in the exhibit, too. It isn't colored quite this dramatically, but um, if you, you see, the, the Charter of North Carolina uh, colony was supposed to extend to the Pacific. Now, if you're wondering where, where Western Tennessee would have been <laughs> had that actually happened, um, this, is, uh, this is how it would start out. Monterey would be in, in West Tennessee and San Luis Obispo, nice wine country in there. Would, would have, could have been great. Um, so a couple more maps uh, attempting to show the Great Lakes. I'm going I'm to concentrate on a couple of maps by this English cartographer named John Kerry, who publishes uh, a, a series of maps of, of regions of, of the United States like this, uh, beginning in 1805. And I guess if you look at the Great well, they're recognizable, and he's gotten rid of the fake. Uh, no, he hasn't gotten rid of the fake islands. They're still there. There's Royale, but there's Filippo. In fact, this uh, actually um, f went back to the Mitchell map. The Mitchell map was used, as I said, to, to draw the Treaty of Peace. Can I get back there? How far away was it? Um, it's, uh, when they drew the line uh, for the border, they, they drew it up here, and they said, OK, they drew it across this island and to Isle Royale, and they went south of Isle Royale, and then they went up a river here. And, the, and in the treaty, it said, uh, oh, nor, it said north of the Isles, Filippo and Pontchartrain, <coughs> and, uh, and Isle Royale or something. And so they, they, they cited in the actual treaty document two islands that just didn't exist. And so for the next uh, 70 years, they were, they were looking, and the, and the British were arguing that, oh, this is what, this is what Isle Pontchartrain was. And the Americans said, no, 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 it was this island. And you know, finally, it took, a, it took a long, it wasn't until the 1840s when they finally ruled that, in fact, those islands didn't exist. And, but here they are, 1805, it still shows the border going across this non-existent island. So anyway, um, this is Kerry's 1805 map. And uh, that would have served fine, except when, in 1805, Ohio became a state. And so in later editions, he had to, he had to add Ohio. Here, the, the general geography is pretty good. There's Chicago, the Portage, uh, St. Joseph, Michigan, Detroit. But when he got to 1825, by that time, there were already, Ohio had become a state, Indiana had become a state, Illinois had become a state. And um, he had to fit them in somehow. He didn't change the basic geography. He didn't have any better information. But um, you can see it gave him some problems because uh, here, for instance, is the bottom of Lake Michigan. Um, well, Illinois, first of all, is landlocked. It has, it has no lake. This is Illinois. Um, Fort Dearborn in Chicago is in Wisconsin, what's now Wisconsin. Um, Indiana is here. There's it, it just, it was very hard to fit in. And the reason was he had, he actually had a very good um, observation for the, oh yeah, this is indicating his basic difficulty. How do you fit three states like that 
into that space between the Mississippi and the western border of Pennsylvania. Now he knew uh, for a certainty about, he actually, his, his uh, longitude for the west end of Lake Superior is pretty good. It's actually right about 92 degrees west, which is what he shows. His longitude for the east end of Lake Ontario is also right on. Also, the western border of Pennsylvania. And the reason that's right on is because of the Mason-Dixon line, which, of course, was surveyed on the ground with guys lugging chains and blazing through trees and making paths and marking on the ground the how many hundred miles to the western border of Pennsylvania. So he had those three, those things pretty well fixed. But he was very vague about the Mississippi River. There weren't any accurate observations out there. And this, this lake system in here was just uh, very, very little known. Uh, that's the western border of Ohio, this is the western border of Indiana, and this is the westernmost bulge of, the, of uh, Illinois on the Mississippi. So how did this little problem get solved? Well, unlike our other examples, it wasn't solved from the water, it was solved on land. And it was solved by people dragging chains like this um, across the country and orienting them with compasses like this. The general um, in the, North, uh, the Northwest Territory, which was this area here, uh, was, uh, was decided to, to divide it completely into parcels. Of course, you folks down here, you have the, the meets and bounds system, where you just sort of said from this tree to that rock to the river and then back this far. Uh, but they decided they wanted something a little more orderly for the Northwest Territories. And so they devised this system of public lands consisting of six mile square townships and divided into 36 uh, square sections. And they first uh, did this in the very uh, eastern part of uh, Ohio in what was called the Seven Ranges. That was done in 1787. They were just kind of experimenting, really. They didn't quite know how they were going to expand this, this grid across the Northwest Territories. But they, they, and Ohio is really very much a, uh, an experiment. If you look at the, the, the land surveys of Ohio, there are different, slightly different uh, orientations. And sli they, don't, they don't match up perfectly. They didn't really have a standard meridian. But by the time they got into Indiana, they started establishing a standard meridian. So you'd have one north-south line where you, you would number all the ranges and all the townships. And Indiana and Illinois were both settled from the south. So uh, they became states 1816, 1818. But at the time they, they attained statehood, uh, all the whole northern part of the states were, were un- uh, uh, had, well, they weren't unpopulated, but they were lightly populated and uh, did not have the benefit of the township and range surveys. Uh, in Illinois, uh, by 1830 uh, about, they had actually surveyed a little extension up here because they wanted to build a canal from Chicago down to the Illinois River, the Illinois-Michigan Canal. And so they, they divided that. Uh, and uh, the federal government uh, started getting rid of that land. Meanwhile, on either side of it, it was still Indian country. So as these surveys progressed, they bumped up into the, to the water. And it was only really when this survey got up here in about 1830 that they were able to say with considerable certainty and accuracy, this is where the western shore of Lake Michigan hits at that point. And as the survey continues, Wisconsin becomes a state in 48. Gradually, uh, the entire lower peninsula of Michigan and, of course, the entire Lake Michigan and the location of the Mississippi River, they're all determined accurately by measurements on the ground. Briefly, this is what happened. Starting with the Mason-Dixon line, which, after all, starts in tidewater and was measured uh, by chain and compass, and then extending the General Land Office surveys west and north <coughs> and east and west. They finally uh, 
uh, we're able to determine the outline of the Great Lakes. And that's how, that's how this little bit of geography got mapped, strictly from the land. So that's all I have to say, but I'm happy to answer questions if you, if you have any. I'll try to answer them, that is. Yes. Uh, 